Welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. This is Friday, day five, the final day of our virtual Watershed Congress week. Uh, thanks for joining us again today. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with many other organizations. My name is Cherry Town. I'm Director of Grants and Operations with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and I'm your moderator for this session, The Lower Delaware, an Ecosystem in the Balance. Our speakers today are Doug O'Malley, Director of Environment New Jersey, Dr. Eric Sildorf, Restoration Director and Senior Scientist at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and Jessica O'Neill, Senior Attorney at Penn Future, uh, who's based in the Philadelphia region. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Doug, over to you. Super. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry. And just a huge thank you to the whole Delaware River Keeper Network team um, that is helping to pull off not only this presentation, but the entire week of presentations for the Watershed uh, Congress. And also uh, a huge thank you to all the groups that helped to, to make uh, this event possible uh, that was just uh, shared. Uh, and then uh, definitely a big thank you to all of you that are joining. I know we have some frequent flyers uh, or frequent swimmers, as the case may be, um, that are joining us this morning. And uh, obviously, uh, we'll get a chance to hear from both myself, and Dr. Eric uh, Sildorf uh, from the Delaware Keeper Network, as well as Jessica O'Neill from Penn Future. Uh, my name is, is Doug O'Malley. I serve as the Director of Environment New Jersey. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to get a chance to talk about not only the history of the Delaware River, but the history of a species which really defines the story of, of the Delaware and its trajectory over the course of the last century. Um, next slide. A and you know, really this ultimately the story of the Delaware and the story of its aquatic health, uh, you know, ultimately is uh, in some ways about a, a paradox, right? Because this, uh, you know, staring in front of us right now is a picture uh, of the, the lower Delaware, uh, right near uh, Rat Island, um, which in, in many ways is kind of a picture of paradise. Um, you know, just until today, it still felt like summer. <laughs> uh, hopefully all of you had, had some good memories uh, along the Delaware this summer as well. And the paradox, of course, is that uh, this section of the river, which is just a little bit south of the Philadelphia airport, uh, this uh, section of the river by Rat Island uh, is essentially the, the, the bullseye the target zone for hypoxia uh, in, in the lower Delaware, in especially in the summer months. Uh, this is a, a dead zone effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's really why we're here today is because uh, our organizations, as well as many others are urging the Delaware Basin Commission to upgrade the designated use of the river uh, between uh, Philadelphia and Camden, a little, you know, roughly in that neighborhood uh, down to Wilmington to protect all documented existing uses. And this includes not only the maintenance of uh, fish species, but also the propagation. Um, and this is hugely important because obviously, as we all know, not all fish are created equal. Some are much more sensitive to uh, pollutant loading and to levels of dissolved oxygen. Um, and then the, the designated use also includes, as part of propagation, spawning in the nursery habitat for migratory fish. And we'll get a chance to, to talk more in depth on this, but um, for many of you that that know here, you know there's a, a been a ton of attention on the resurgence of shad uh, in the Lower Delaware. Right, there's a shad festival in in Lambertville. There's a shad festival in in Penn Treaty uh, Park and in, in Fish Town in, in Philadelphia. Um, but the the story is is not just about the shad. It's also about the Atlantic sturgeon, uh, which is a endangered species. And so that's a, a huge reason why we are calling on the DRBC to change the level of dissolved oxygen um, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, change the level uh, of dis dissolved oxygen to be more protective from the 3.5 uh, milligram standard established uh, in the summer of love, uh, you know, back before uh, many of us were born in 1967 uh, to a 6.3 uh, milligram per liter standard. Um, and obviously they're, they're you know, th this is a trajectory of the river uh, and a promise of the Clean Water Act that remains unfulfilled right now. Uh, but to kind of understand where we are right now, it, it is important to kind of remember where we came from. Um, so next, uh, next slide. Uh, now, this is obviously part of the, the kind of the battle days uh, along the Delaware. This is a, a fish kill on the Philadelphia side of the river from the 1930s. 
Um, but in many ways, this is kind of the uh, the memory, uh, you know, at least within uh, the, the memory that we've kind of seen that has been photographed, that's been passed down. There's also another memory, and that's even before uh, the turn of the century, in the 19th century, kind of pre, uh, you know, pre pre the wide use of photography, um, that had the Lower Delaware being a hotbed for fishing, and specifically in the New Jersey side of the river in Gloucester County in the 1870s, uh, you had a tremendous industry that was developed around uh, the fishing of a sturgeon. Uh, and specifically, um, you had a, a massive yield um, in, the eight, in the late 1890s. You had a yield of over 5,000 Atlantic sturgeon, more, a more than 1,000 kegs of caviar worth more than $2.1 million in today's dollars. Uh, that's literally from one uh, kind of one fishery, Fancy Hill Fishery in, in Gloucester County. And um, that was, uh, you know, it, it, things got so bad, there was a sturgeon war <laughs> between New Jersey and Delaware. Now, obviously, that is roughly around the same time that water quality started to decrease with the massive industrialization of the river. And that's a, a legacy that is in many ways forgotten of the successful fisheries and the, the sturgeon, uh, the levels of sturgeon in the river, so much so that, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, anglers had to be careful about having too many sturgeon uh, in their boats because it's just a huge bony fish. Um, you literally could sink from at that level of, of a sturgeon uh, in your nets and in your boats. Um, we're a long way from that. And so the kind of the recent memory uh, for those, those of us that are much older is of these kind of battle days. And to kind of go forward a little bit, um, next slide. You know, the battle days certainly were bad. And this is pre-Clean Water Act. Um, and it ultimately, it comes from the just urbanized nature of the lower Delaware and, and the broader Philadelphia and Camden metropolitan areas. Um, in the mid 60s, there were a million pounds of waste going into the river every day. And more of 60% of that was coming from sewage treatment plants from Philadelphia, from Camden, from Wilmington. Um, and specifically, the bacteria count at the water intake at Torsdale was 30, more than 39,000 per 100 milliliters in 1964, just an extraordinary level. So this was you know, nitrogen loading kind of, you know, to its nth degree. Um, and, you know, obviously it wasn't just sewage. There was also blood from slaughterhouses, oil from refineries like golf oil and sun oil. There was a toxic waste from chemical companies like Roman Haas and DuPont. Um, th this was truly the, the battle days. Um, and I think it's important to kind of go back to that time because this is the regulatory uh, era. You know, this is even before the Clean Water Act, but this also was the regulatory era um, the DRBC, which had just been founded in the early 1960s under President Kennedy, uh, was coming into existence and trying to uh, set standards that would, uh, you know, decrease the 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 uh, the fact that the lower dollar was an open sewer. Um, next uh, next slide. So, you know, th this is where um, when we talk about where we were. And, and how we saw a renewal and rebirth in the Lower Delaware. You know, it did start with the DRBC taking action, specifically the action in uh, 1967 uh, to have a, a, a DO standard. Um, and that DO standard was, uh, you know, very kind of cutting edge at the time, as I, I previously referenced, uh, we are still essentially living <laughs> with the legacy of that dissolved oxygen standard that predates uh, the Clean Water Act. Um, and, and this is kind of where, when we look at the renewal and rebirth of the Lower Delaware, uh, obviously the Clean Water Act had a huge role to play. Um, uh, obviously actions from the DRBC also had a huge role to play. Um, but it is important to, to note that on dissolved oxygen, that has been a, a thorn in the side for the Lower Delaware because we've not seen, uh, you know, it's essentially we've, we've seen multiple efforts to increase um, those protections, but they've, they've not they have not ultimately been successful. And so it's important to kind of remind ourselves of exactly where we came from. Because in the 1980s, DRBC uh, completed a use attainability project um, that evaluated upgrades that would bring the commission standards for the lower, lower Delaware into compliance with the Clean Water Act. So this is, you know, now at this point, more than 35 years ago. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, the DRBC did um, you know, did adopt some uh, partial upgrades for primary contact recreational standards that were adopted in the early 90s as part of the direct result of this project. But the commission also at the same time delayed action on aquatic life uses. 
and on the dissolved oxygen criteria because I wanted to engage in further additional studies throughout the 1990s. And so there was a lot of effort spent, you know, now at this point, you know, in the 25 years ago uh, and multiple hearings and staff time um, throughout, throughout the 90s, uh, the commission ultimately took no action. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's ultimately kind of leading us to the present day because, um, you know, despite, uh, you know, a, you know, close to, to two decades of study modeling, this obviously continued throughout this century, we have not seen a, an increase in that dissolved oxygen criteria um, for, uh, for the lower Delaware. There was a dissolved oxygen uh, petition uh, within recent memory within the last decade. So now we're getting kind of a little closer to the present day. Um, that DO, DO petition resulted in a four-year delay by the commission to initiate substantial uh, work um, based on some of the commitments made in, in 2009. Um, and so after the commission had kind of failed to, to follow through on, on those commitments in 2009, um, you had uh, you know, a multitude of organizations led by the Delaware Keeper Network uh, petition the commission for immediate action. Uh, at that point, you know, you can kind of sense a, a trend here. Uh, four years later, you had a 2017 resolution to commit to a six-year process of studies and deliberations. So this is where we're essentially in a rinse-repeat cycle at this point, where DRBC is uh, looking and studying uh, this issue, um, despite, uh, you know, decades of, of inaction on the dissolved oxygen standard. So why, why, does, this, why does this matter? What, 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 is, um, what is the cost of uh, this uh, this delay. Uh, next slide. Um, well, some of it is that the, the problem has been getting worse. We'll hear more about that uh, a little later in the presentation from, uh, from Dr. Eric Sildorf. Um, but you know, one of the things that has changed um, in the estuary is we increasingly are seeing increased uh, temperature change because of the impacts of climate change. And obviously climate change is massive impacts for our world and our communities. Um, it has impacts on extreme weather, which obviously we're still struggling with post Ida. Um, but the, the thing I guess I wanted to, to highlight here is that um, from a climate perspective, we are you know, essentially living through the coolest summer uh, that we will see. Um, and that's a little bit of a uh, hyperbole, but the idea is that we will see um, extreme temperatures increase uh, we'll see um, you know, more extreme heat events. Um, that obviously is, is bad news um, from a dissolved oxygen standard uh, for, uh, you know, in, in the lower Delaware as we see a changing climate um, kind of impact, um, you know, be, a, be an impact on uh, the dissolved oxygen uh, standard. Uh, next slide. Um, so this ultimately gets at the, the broader question, and uh, Jessica will, will, will hit on this as well, on kind of existing use versus designated use. And so this is why, um, as I said before, you know, the, the, the DRBC's legacy here of, of kind of multiple years of studies and ultimate inaction um, is creating a, a mismatch between the existing use and the designated use. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about the exact uh, migration and reproduction of the Atlantic sturgeon. Um, but the idea here is that, you know, we, we need the river and the dissolved oxygen standard to be the most protective standard uh, possible for all species, not just uh, for some. Um, next slide. Uh, and then this is, this is as I referenced, um, you know, the Atlantic sturgeon is a very sensitive species. So, you know, this is our, you know, uh, you, you know, aquatic canary in the, in the coal mine. Um, the Atlantic surgeon requires incredibly, uh, the highest um, dissolved oxygen requirements of any species in the lower Delaware. Um, it should be noted that the Academy of Natural Sciences has a recommendation for the 6.3 milligram, milligram per liter standard. And then there's just a you know, and a, I want to say an infinite, it's the opposite of infinite, a, a increasingly small population of sturgeon measuring in the hundreds. Um, and it's impossible to get the exact right amount, but the sturgeon, they, they live a long life. Uh, they don't, um, uh, you know, they are not, uh, you know, they're not salmon. They don't breed all the time. They don't spawn all the time. They're, they're very infrequent spawners. And so, you know, this is where we need a dissolved oxygen standard that is most protective for this species. Because when we talk about an, an endangered species, this is the, the definition, right? There are literally only a few hundred left. 
and we need to have a dissolved oxygen standard that is protective uh, of the species. And we'll talk a little bit later on, on what the uh, level of DEO looks like in the lower Delaware, and it's not especially a, a promising trend. Uh, next slide. Um, so with that, uh, let me turn it over uh, to Jessica. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm Jessica O'Neill. I'm an attorney with Penn Future. I'm based in our Philadelphia office. Penn Future is a statewide environmental organization focused on protecting our air, water, and on energy issues across the Commonwealth and beyond. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about the legal framework that's applicable to what Doug was just discussing, and that's going to be followed up by what Dr. Sil Sildorf talks about in terms of the data. Um, I know a lot of you are very familiar with this, and there is a lot of overlap here with what was discussed in the keynote presentation um, of the Watershed Congress on Monday. So I'm viewing this as sort of an end of the week wrap up on similar themes. Um, but whereas the keynote presentation was focused on recreational use of uh, the river, this is talking about uh, dissolved oxygen, but under a similar legal framework. So, and, and these pictures here, um, just to let you know, are of the river from Penn Treaty Park. So these are from 2019 and from a fishing derby for kids that was held then. So you can see um, how the river looks um, in its, one of its most urban areas. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Of course, the overriding legal principles that govern here come from the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act has as its main objective to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. So what does that mean? Well, the specific goal is that all waters will be fishable and swimmable wherever attainable. Fishable and swimmable means water quality, which provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and provides for recreation in and on the water. That's from the first section of the act. Um, okay, so how do we get there? Um, this is sort of a series of steps. Uh, the way that we try to get there is that the states set water quality standards. These standards then govern permits issued for discharges into those water bodies. The Clean Water Act doesn't set out a, you can't do any discharging into a water body. It sets out a, you can't do any discharging without a permit. And the state water quality standards are going to govern the limits applicable in those permits. Uh, next slide, please. So water quality standards aren't uniform. They're based on the uses of the waters and those uses are, are going to be set. There are designated protected water quality uses. Each water body must have a designated use. The state must designate a use for the water body. Then the water quality standards set criteria that can be numeric, which is a certain specified amount of a certain chemical or pollutant in a certain amount of water, or they can be narrative or descriptive. Um, and these can also be, they are also based on the use of the water. And because the Clean Water Act was designed to improve water quality and not let it become worse, we get to the third point here, water quality standards include anti-degradation protections that protect the existing uses of the water. Remember the Clean Water Act is designed to elevate and to improve water bodies to be fishable and swimmable. And, if, and the anti-degradation protections are supposed to make that happen. Next slide, please. Importantly, and as you just heard, there's two types of uses in this legal framework. The first is the designated use. This designated use then becomes part of the water quality standards established by the state and codified in regulations. The designated use is sometimes thought of as the desired use or the water quality goals, especially in those cases where the water quality of the water body may be below that is needed to meet the designated use. Because the designated use is part of the regulations, it can be upgraded or in some rare cases downgraded. The designated use must take into account aquatic life, wildlife, and recreation uses, because as, as I've been talking about, those are the basic goals of the act. And the designated use, even though it might only be for a particular segment of a water body, even a particular segment upstream, must also be protective of downstream waters. Next slide, please. The second type of use that matters here under the Clean Water Act is the existing use. The existing uses are those uses actually attained in the water body after a magic date of November 28th, 1975, whether or not they are included in the water quality standards. And here's where the anti-degradation protections that I just mentioned come into play. The anti-degradation protections mean that the existing use cannot be degraded. If there is an existing use, you can't just let the water body become in such worse shape that that use can't happen anymore. Remember, the Clean Water Act, importantly, is about uplifting, about 
improving water quality, not degrading it. As a result, the act mandates that the designated use, remember that's the desired use or the goal use, must be at least as protective as the existing use because the existing use has to be maintained and protected. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the DRBC and Doug just spent a fair bit of time talking about the DRBC or the Delaware River Basin Commission, which is the interstate compact that conserves and maintains the resources of the Delaware River. The DRBC sets water quality standards for the river, including establishing the designated uses and water quality criteria for various sections of the river. These standards then form the basis for the effluent limitations, the permit limitations in DRBC dockets, which are essentially uh, the permits issued to dischargers into the river. And the water quality criteria set by the DRBC are also incorporated into state water quality standards. Next slide, please. The DRBC has been considering the question of aquatic life use in the Delaware River estuary since at least 2009. In 2017, the DRBC passed a resolution. Um, and if you could hit next, I think we'll get some of the resolution up on the slide here. Oh, sorry, back up. Well, we've lost a piece of the resolution, but that's okay. Um, which, and the resolution found that the water quality standards, including designated uses and water quality criteria should be up updated, consistent with Clean Water Act goals as quickly as possible and practicable. So the DRBC is looking at this, they're evaluating what the DO standards should be in the river, but they've been doing it for a very long time. Um, so what has the DRBC done up to this point? At this point, we've had further studies. So as Doug mentioned, this is not a, we just started working on this yesterday kind of project. Um, the DRBC has been looking at this since at least 2009. They've been studying, they passed a resolution in 2017. Here it is 2021, and we're still doing further studies. In fact, there has already been a great deal of study providing evidence about existing uses in the river. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Dr. Eric Sildorf from the Delaware Riverkeeper Network to tell you about those studies and what that evidence shows. Dr. Sildorf. Thanks so much, Jessica. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you for attending. Uh, and it really is a remarkable story to, to talk about the comeback of the Delaware estuary, the tidal Delaware River in and around Philadelphia, Camden, down to Chester and Wilmington, uh, because it is a story re of rebirth uh, and, and restoration. And what I'd like to follow on with what both Doug and Jessica have highlighted is what are the fish telling us? We were talking about uh, the rebirth and, and the restoration. And then as we think about the Clean Water Act and this idea of existing use and protecting that existing use, well, what are the fish telling us in terms of um, their level of restoration uh, and in particular the question about spawning you know the reproduction of these fish the rearing of young life stages uh, and all of that is incorporated in the term uh, propagation i'll go back and like doug talk a little bit about the bad old days this is a dissolved oxygen graph for Philadelphia at the Ben Franklin Bridge, and I'm hoping folks can see my cursor here. Um, starting back in 1965, the USGS, uh, in cooperation with uh, the Delaware River Basin Commission, started monitoring dissolved oxygen on a regular basis. And so we have a really detailed picture of what dissolved oxygen looks like going back to the 1960s. These are July data, and this is the full um, data set in each one of these box uh, box plots for that month of July in each one of these years with dissolved oxygen concentration along the x-axis. And, and two lines on there, the 3.5 milligram per liter standard that Doug mentioned was established in 1967. And then a 6.3 milligram per liter number that comes out of a DRBC commission report from the Academy of Natural Sciences saying that if we really want to protect all of the fish species in the Delaware estuary, we would need to solve oxygen consistently at or above 6.3 milligrams per liter. And what you see through time is that back in the 1960s, it really was the bad old days. Um, there, there was no oxygen in the river, right? This was a dead river for uh, for tens of miles of the river. And, and this is true anoxia. And so we had a, a condition of both hypoxia, which is uh, depressed oxygen and anoxia in the Delaware estuary. And then with the Clean Water Act and DRBC's regulations in the late 1960s and then the 1970s, 
with the building of wastewater treatment plants and the implementation of that, you started to see an increase in dissolved oxygen through the 1980s, the 1990s. And then in the 1990s, we started to regularly attain that original goal of 3.5 milligrams per liter. It was, a, it was a big lift in the 1960s to say we were going to get there. And it was a compromised position when DRBC issued its rulemaking in the 1960s. They were looking at higher standards. They were looking at lower standards. And eventually, they said, well, we think we can get to 3.5 milligrams per liter. But in terms of uh, designated uses and existing uses, that 3.5 milligram per liter was only intended to protect adult fish. It was intended to achieve the designated use of maintenance um, and not propagation. It was not uh, expected in the 1960s that we would have fish spawning in and around Philadelphia uh, anytime in our lifetimes. Um, so so it, was, it was a modest goal. And then thinking about what's actually happened and what the fish are responding to, we see that dissolved oxygen again in the 1990s started to give above that 3.5 milligram per liter standard. But then it's been hit or miss for the last about 20 years. We've had some really strong years, uh, the late 1990s, um, some really weak years, 2005 here, and then it bounces back up. 2014 was arguably the best water quality in the Delaware estuary in 100 years. That's 2014 was an extraordinary year and we saw an extraordinary response in terms of the fish propagation in the estuary. But then just uh, last summer, 2020 was among the most uh, depressed dissolved oxygen uh, summers in the last 20 years. So, so um, without the protections and without the upgraded standards, what we've seen over the last 20 years is that sometimes we have good summers and sometimes we have bad summers uh, and we have no ability to consistently maintain those good summers. And so this is where the, the difference in the terms between maintenance and propagation comes in. Maintenance is the goal, it's the designated use that was established in 1967 by the Delaware River Basin Commission, saying we want to keep adult fish alive. We're recognizing that it was you know, too big of a lift to go all the way to propagation uh, back in the 1960s. And again, they were using you know, some, some very early generation computer models to make their predictions. Um, and, and the question then we have is, with those improved dissolved oxygen conditions, um, do we only see maintenance or do we actually have an existing use? Do we actually see fish that are that are reproducing and rearing in these zones um, that exceed that goal, that original goal of maintenance that was established in 1967? One thing that I'll, I'll highlight and in the maps that I'll show you is that the estuary is broken up into different zones. I'm going to be focusing on zones three, four, and the upper portion of zone five. There are different goals set for different parts of the estuary and different dissolved oxygen standards. And so in this graph, this is a historic representation of how bad dissolved oxygen was during the 1960s. And, and these bad conditions persisted for decades. It certainly was this bad after World War II through the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. But we have evidence from the city of Philadelphia that dissolved oxygen was in the hypoxic conditions, only one or two milligrams per liter, going back all the way to like 1910, so over 100 years ago. But what we see here is a zone of severe hypoxia and uh, anoxia from the center of Philadelphia at the Ben Franklin Bridge all the way down past Walt Whitman Bridge, past the Schuylkill River confluence and the airport, down past Chester to the Delaware state line and extending almost all the way to Wilmington. Um, an extraordinary long area of, of a lack of oxygen this covers zone three. Uh, most of Philadelphia is divided in and called zone three by DRBC and the water quality standards. It also includes the lower uh, a portion of Philadelphia in zone four. Zone four extends all the way to the state border between Pennsylvania and Delaware. And then the upper portion of zone five, where we have the reduced standard of maintenance, extends to just below the mouth of the Christina uh, and where the Brandywine Christina accommodation comes in. In terms of what the fish are telling us, the Delaware River Basin Commission in 2015 issued a report and they relied on these three data sets to evaluate the question of um, have fish actually um, established maintenance or have they gone past maintenance and are they actually propagating? Are they spawning in zone three, four, and five? And is that spawning successful? And so the three data sources are a um, a SANE survey by the state of New Jersey it was begun in 1980. It was primarily targeted for striped bass, but all other species were, uh, were recorded uh, uh, that were collected in those SANEs, uh, collected along beaches. In 
2002, 2003, and 2004, the second data set comes from ichthyoplankton survey, which means that um, they, they tow nets through the water column and they catch the early life stages, the eggs and the really you know, like almost non-swimmable uh, larvae that are caught in those nets and that are entrained in the water column. Uh, and they, they count that for the target species. Um, this is done by PSENG and it's related to their permits for the nuclear power plants down at Salem, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and those target species included 12 fish and two invertebrates. And so really important, this is particularly valuable because it's actually looking directly at that spawning, that those eggs that are produced by fish species and whether the larvae um, are rearing in those. And then the final thing that we'll touch on is a species specific survey done by the state of Delaware for the Atlantic sturgeon, a federally listed species listed as federally endangered uh, uh, um, in 2012. And the Delaware River population is a genetically unique population that is literally on the brink of extinction. The spawning runs that come back every year are estimated to be between only 100 and 300 fish um, that come back into the Delaware estuary. The, the total numbers are larger than that, but the spawning run that comes back in is extremely low. And what the state of uh, Delaware looks at, the Fish and Wildlife Group, looked at young of year and one-year-old fish that are called river resident fish that stay in the freshwater uh, and lowest brackish water sections of the estuary before they move out to the Atlantic Ocean. And so looking at those data sources, the first we're gonna look at is the SANE survey for striped bass. And what you can see, and as probably not unexpected given that dissolved oxygen graph, is that in the early 1980s, there was no oxygen. And so there was uh, a very limited fish population and essentially uh, zero successful reproduction by striped bass in zone three, zone four. A few uh, uh, young striped bass started to come in in 82, 83, 84, but literally they, they were not catching any fish when they started the survey in the 1980s. That the, um, the Delaware estuary spawning run of striped bass had been eliminated. But through the years, what they found is that uh, striped bass were coming back and were successfully spawning throughout the Delaware estuary, including zone three, zone four and zone five. And so now the Delaware estuary is one of the major spawning runs for striped bass again on the Eastern seaboard, part of its native range. And it's really extraordinary to see <clears throat> the fact that striped bass have recovered um, and, and uh, by some estimates are actually back or returned to almost their historic levels uh, in terms of a fishery out in, the, out in the ocean. Looking at another iconic species, the American shad, this uh, graph is oriented a little bit differently. We have the entire estuary or, or ab above the bay here with uh, the head of tide on the x-axis here at River Mile 133. This is zone two of the estuary down to uh, the city limits around Philadelphia at 108.4. Zone three then is this first section um, uh, of depressed oxygen and oxygen standards. Zone four then is that second, second section of downgraded uses. And then zone five is this larger area. And what we see in the ichthyoplankton surveys, again, those nets that are towed and uh, with eggs shown in blue, um, uh, the yolk sac larvae shown in the open square and the post yolk sac larvae shown in red is that for zone three and zone four, we consistently see uh, successful reproduction, successful uh, presence of eggs and the rearing of those eggs to uh, yolk sac larvae and post yolk sac larvae consistently uh, year after year for, uh, for those years in which ichthyoplankton data were collected. And when we look across all of the species that were evaluated in the DRBC 2015 report, we do see that for all nine C species, there was evidence, consistent evidence of successful reproduction. And that as DRBC's report says, the existing use, existing use attained within the Delaware estuary in the period between 2000 and 2014 includes propagation for zones three, four and the upper 8.8 .8 .8 miles of zone five. So yes, uh, successful reproduction has been established. <clears throat> we exceeded those goals from back in the 1960s. Um, and now the existing use uh, for the entire estuary, including zone three, four, and that upper portion of zone five <clears throat> in consistently includes propagation. But what the risk here is, is that we haven't upgraded the standards. We're actually in violation of the Clean Water Act and DRBC has known about this. Doug talked about the study in the 1980s and the early 1990s and DRBC failed to take action and raise the DO standard <clears throat> so that we still have that 3.5 milligram per liter standard. 
Similarly, DRBC began talking about raising the DO standard in 2009, but it wasn't until 2017 that a resolution was passed by the commission saying, okay, we are gonna study this some more. Um, and the danger with that is that we do have uh, species that are at risk and perhaps no species that is at more risk than the endangered um, Atlantic sturgeon uh, and the genetically unique population of Atlantic sturgeon here in the Delaware River. This graph is a little bit complicated, a little bit hard to understand. Um, let me walk through it really quickly. On the x-axis here are the number of days throughout the summer, July, sorry, June, July, and August, where dissolved oxygen was better than the number that DRBC's own commission study said um, would protect Atlantic sturgeon. 6.3 milligrams per liter is that protective value for dissolved oxygen. And so the greater the number of the days out of 92 days, um, the greater uh, the protection for Atlantic sturgeon. And then on the y-axis is the data from the state of Delaware where they look at age zero and age one fish, particularly the age zero fish, the young of year fish, um, and whether or not we see successful reproduction. And this graph is really extraordinary and it raises alarm bells because in those summers where there is poor dissolved oxygen conditions, where very few of those 92 days exceed that 6.3 milligram per liter standard, there are essentially no young sturgeon in the Delaware estuary. We get a complete failure of a year class of an endangered species when the oxygen levels are not suitable. But when we get a lucky year, and we don't know all of the reasons for the lucky years, we tend to get really strong numbers uh, of Atlantic sturgeon, including uh, 2014, again, the best dissolved oxygen summer in, in 100 years. And then we see uh, an immediate response by Atlantic sturgeon, strong numbers of young fish, and then the biologists who actually are out on the boats looking at fish, improved uh, quality, um, longer fish, uh, more robust, greater body weight. Uh, so everything looks better when we have better dissolved oxygen. And so this is not an academic question. Um, DRBC in 2015 clearly stated that propagation exists throughout the estuary. As Jessica covered, the Clean Water Act says we need to establish those existing uses as our designated uses and to upgrade the dissolved oxygen criteria. And the lack of action is what is so dangerous, is that we are actually killing an endangered species every summer when we have those bad dissolved oxygen conditions. DRBC and other government agencies will be like, hey, we're doing fine. We're attaining that 3.5 milligram per liter standard set in 1967. But the problem is, is that 3.5 milligram per liter standard is a lethal concentration of oxygen for Atlantic sturgeon and for other species of fish in our estuary. And in particular, something that has been extremely alarming for us that, that have been watching this closely is that for 2019, 2020, and 2021, oxygen saturation fell below 50% in each of those three summers based on those USGS data um, at the sensors at the Ben Franklin Bridge and down near the Commodore Berry Bridge in Chester. So we are seeing lethal concentrations. The lack of action is allowing dissolved oxygen conditions again to fall. At Chester, uh, Pennsylvania, we saw dissolved oxygen conditions all the way down to 2.8 milligrams per liter. DRBC will again rightly state that, well, the 24 hour average was above 3.5 milligrams per liter, but that misses the point. We are literally going into that danger zone of lethal concentrations of dissolved oxygen. And this is why uh, we have a need for immediate action and why we cannot tolerate more delays and further studies and postponing decision for another five years or 10 years or longer. Uh, we might not have Atlantic sturgeon left uh, by the time a uh, decision is raised if we, if we follow the existing timeline. So it's a really scary situation. Um, it's clear what needs to be done. We can talk about um, how easy it is to upgrade uh, the dissolved oxygen uh, because it really is just implementing secondary treatment at some of the existing wastewater treatment plants, uh, a process called nitrification that many of the smaller wastewater Water treatment plants have used, um, but the larger treatment plants haven't. So it is not a heavy lift. We're not talking about billions and billions of uh, unneeded technology. We're talking about uh, using conventional technology um, to upgrade our treatment plants, uh, improve dissolved oxygen conditions, and to allow endangered species like Atlantic sturgeon to survive uh, uh, in the Delaware River. So with that, let me uh, hand it back over to Jessica um, and, uh, and wrap this up about what we're asking. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Sildorf. So, so what do we do about this? As Dr. Sildorf was just saying, we have a problem because we know we have an existing use. Uh, we have this propagation occurring for these fish, and we know that our 
designated use doesn't match it. And we need to take action to fix that. You know, we called this presentation an ecosystem in the balance because we are at a balance here, right? We're at a place where we could maintain the dissolved oxygen standard the way that it is and forego those improvements um, in fish life, in aquatic life that we see in the river, or we could maintain the improvements that we've seen by upgrading the DO level. So that's, so what we want to see is we wanna see the DRBC take some action to um, upgrade the existing use to reflect uh, the aquatic life activity that is occurring in the river. Um, so our organizations and a number of others that you can see here on this slide, submitted a petition to the DRBC to upgrade the designated uses of the Delaware in this urban stretch of the river. The petition lays out as Doug and as uh, Dr. Sildur just, just discussed, how the DRBC's current water quality standards don't adequately protect the fish and aquatic life that have returned to the, this stretch of the river in recent decades. So the petition calls on DRBC and the member states to comply with the Clean Water Act, excuse me, and to formally recognize and protect the existing aquatic life uses that take place in this stretch of the river. And it urges DRBC to upgrade the designated use standards for this stretch of the river to include not just maintenance, but propagation of resident fish and other aquatic life, as well as spawning and nursery habitat for migratory fish. Next slide, please. The petition also encourages the DRBC to raise the DO standard. As Dr. Sildorf was just saying, we're still at this 3.5 level, which is not adequate to protect sturgeon. So we ask the DRBC to raise the DO standard that's needed to protect the health of aquatic life in the river and support these upgraded designated use standards. Of course, as we've discussed throughout this presentation, the water quality here has improved, fish have returned, but the DO standard hasn't been updated since it was first established in 1967. Um, we chose 6.3 milligrams per liter as the amount to ask for in our petition because that's the amount that was identified in a 2018 report commissioned by DRBC as higher as necessary to support the spawning and rearing of the critically endangered population of Atlantic sturgeon. So upgrading the DO standard to this amount would place more limits on permitted discharges into the river to more adequately protect the fish and aquatic life now living and reproducing in the estuary. Um, of course, we want to ensure that these water quality standards don't allow merely the maintenance of these fish, but to allow them to thrive. If you could go to the next slide, please. So you'll see some links here on this slide. Um, and we'd like to extend an invitation to you and to all of your organizations to join us and to sign on to this uh, fish protection petition. We provided a couple links here. Uh, the first is a link to the full petition. Um, if you wanna take a look at that, your organization can sign on there at that second link. And then um, if you're acting um, as an individual, you can sign on at one of those three um, links below. As I noted, um, we submitted this petition to the DRBC in March of this past year, but as more groups and individuals sign on, we are updating our petition to show the DRBC just how much support there is for this upgrade, for upgrading the, um, the designated use standards and accordingly upgrading the dissolved oxygen standards that go along with that in order to protect the river. Um, I wanna thank you very much for uh, listening to our presentation today. Um, and um, thank you in advance for anyone who chooses to sign on and to support our petition. I'm gonna flip it back over to, um, to Cherry from Delaware Riverkeeper Network to uh, help us um, address and answer any questions that um, you all might have. Okay, um, I've seen um, that you've posted um, some of those links in the chat. So everyone make sure you're seeing those there. Um, we can uh, also um, make sure that these links um, get up on uh, the Congress website. We'll follow up on that. Um, but let's go to, um, we have a question that um, we want to um, uh, direct your attention to and, and remember um, post questions uh, in the chat that you might have. Um, Jim has a question about concerns about the sturgeon and dredging on Windport at Artificial Island. Um, does anyone want to speak to um, Jim's question? Yeah, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network did uh, send a letter of concern uh, as part of the permitting process at the Delaware River Basin Commission about the wind port. Of course, it's fantastic that we are aggressively pursuing um, alternative energy sources, right? That, that as Doug highlighted, climate change um, is upon us. It's a threat that is impacting our ability to 
you know, protect oxygen in the river, um, to protect endangered species, uh, right? it is affecting all aspects of our lives and it really is a crisis that needs to be addressed. But nevertheless, the wind port presents some challenges for Atlantic sturgeon. As we mentioned, there are very few adult fish that come back into the estuary every year. And as much as we are arguing that a critical part of the recovery of, of Atlantic sturgeon is to allow them to successfully reproduce, another really critical part of their um, their recovery is to make sure that the adults are not killed. And one of the most serious, and some have argued the most serious threat to Atlantic sturgeon is from shipping traffic in the Delaware estuary. The ship strikes of both Delaware River populations and then populations from other river systems um, are extraordinarily high in this system. There is very little wiggle room. These are, these are bottom um, dwelling fish, bottom feeding fish. They like the deepest part of the channel, exactly where the ship traffic is. And so the first risk with the wind port is that the increased ship traffic could lead to additional ship strikes. And there has been no mitigation from the Coast Guard, um, from our federal partners, from the Army Corps of Engineers to try to minimize that ship strike risk. And so this is an active area of concern of a bunch of conservation organizations, of sturgeon researchers. And so, so that's one of the things that we have to worry about is that uh, make, making sure that ship strikes don't um, uh, you know, kill the, the males and females that are moving into the estuary to, uh, to spawn and reproduce. Um, but secondly, also, it's another dredging um, example. Uh, one thing that we've seen over the last 100 years is that every time we dredge <clears throat> the Delaware River, we change the dynamics of this tidal river, and we actually bring the salt front further and further up the estuary every time we dredge in. And so the Army Corps of Engineers recently went to a 45-foot depth, and that brings uh, the salt front further upstream compared to the 20 to 30 foot depth of 100 to 200 years ago. The salt front is, you know, as many um, tens of miles further upstream than it was before. Atlantic sturgeon spawn only in fresh water, and the best habitat for that, for that spawning that we know of currently is in that area around the Commodore Barry, Barry Bridge, where we have really good bedrock and boulder habitat, good, hard, clean substrate for the sturgeon uh, to <clears throat> spawn in. But as we bring that salt front further and further upstream, we have the risk. And during dry summers or dry falls, we actually have that salt front cross over that spawning ground. Um, and so, so with these dredging projects and with changing the hydrodynamics, um, there is too little um, attention being paid to how we are changing the estuary, the salt front, um, and the impacts of the aquatic life in the estuary. The primary concern has been for protecting drinking water, and that certainly is uh, critical in making these decisions, but it's not the only critical decision. We have an endangered species out there and we have to make sure we don't wipe out its spawning grounds in the near future. So a couple of concerns there with the wind port. It's, a great, uh, it's great that we are aggressively pursuing clean energy, uh, but we have to make sure we do it in a sustainable fashion. So um, um, uh, Dr. Sildorf, you may wanna to respond to this question as well, but I'll, I'll put it open to, to anyone here. Um, again, Jim asks, uh, we notice each summer at least one to two dead sturgeon up to three feet on the beach in Salem County. Shall we report this? Yeah, absolutely. That that those uh, those dead sturgeon are part of that ship strike mortality estimation, and primarily through the state agencies, the New, New Jersey Fish and Wildlife or the Delaware Fish and Wildlife. Um, I don't have the link on me right now, but Jim, if you email me, I can get you a link or the contact information to that. Um, that is critical. Um, the the um, there is additional mortality from the impingement and trainment from. Um, the Salem nuclear power plant. And so it's not all ship strikes in terms of artificial mortality of these you know, ancient and, and wonderful fish. Um, so reporting that, um, and some of these biologists will go out and actually pick up specimens and, and do uh, a, you know, an examination of their bodies to look at the, the causes of that. So, so it is important to report those um, and, and we can share that link, Jim. So um, you've talked, to, um, uh, we've heard a lot about the, the, the benefits to um, fish propagation. How might, how might communities living along the Delaware estuary benefit from the, the upgrades that would result here? I've done a lot of talking. Uh, I would be happy if one of my co-presenters want to speak to that first, but. Yeah, actually, I just, I wanted to go back a, a little bit um, to kind of what Jim is, is bringing up. And then I, I think it is important to, to talk about how communities interact with with the river and how dissolved oxygen, you know, benefits obviously the ecosystem, but the, the broader communities as well. I, I just wanted to go back to this question because, um, you know, Jim, you referenced, you know, one or two uh, dead sturgeon, which might not seem like a lot, 
Um, but I, I just wanted to emphasize again that you know, when we talk about it, kind of the surgeon being endangered, it, it, it truly is. Um, I referenced before there are only, you know, a few hundred, um, you know, some estimates put it at less than 300 spawning adults left in the estuary. So one to two fish really does matter. Um, and then the other important thing to know is that the sturgeon thankfully have a long lifespan. So striped bass can live up to 30 years. American shad is a lot less, about eight. Sturgeon can live up to 50 years, but that longer lifetime is a little deceptive because female sturgeon don't return to the estuary for their first spawn until they're roughly around 15 years old. So, uh, you know, and then the, the other kind of key thing to know is that, that, th that potentially that population that's 300 spawning adults, uh, that was roughly half of one day's haul from uh, the Gloucester County Fancy Hill fishery, you know, more than 100 years ago. Um, so that just shows you kind of how far we've we've come. Um, just in terms of the, the this broader question, and I think others can weigh in here on the the benefit to the, the community. Um, you, you know, I mean, some of this is um, you know what is good for you know the goose is good for the gander. What's good for the sturgeon is good more broadly for what a quality. Um, and we can talk a, a little bit about kind of what what it, what what are the solutions that it takes to get to a 3.5, uh, to get to a 6.3 uh, milligram standard, right, to, to upgrade from 3.5. Um, one thing to note here too, is that, uh, you know, the DRBC, and we're obviously um, critical of, of DRBC's current standard, but there are many um, folks, even back in 2017, that supported um, the, the effort to uh, have fish propagation be a designated use. Um, there was actually a majority vote of the Water Quality Advisory Committee to recognize the existing uses of the estuary for fish propagation and to put in interim protection measures to prevent water quality backsliding on dissolved oxygen standards during this kind of ongoing period of study. That, that did not happen. And that's, that's really why you know, we're kind of raising the alarm bell and we're petitioning DRBC because our concern is we don't want to wait uh, several more years because this is not only about water quality that is gonna impact an existing use uh, and harm an endangered species. It's also about the benefit more broadly for the river um, to have more community involvement and engagement in the river. And generally what's good for fish is also good for uh, the existing use of, of human populations as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's it's almost sort of, uh, as I said, this follows on to the keynote presentation for Monday, but we know that people are using the river, right? Um, these urban stretches are different than the upper headwaters. They are different than the bay, but they are part of the river that people use. And improving the dissolved oxygen in the river, allowing the propagation of aquatic life, recognizing that there is this aquatic life use that is occurring in the river, improves the water quality of the river, which may improve the experience of people who are using the river and in fact, encourage more people to be, to be using the river. So, you know, we all know that our systems are really interconnected and this is a place where I think we can, um, we can really see that. We can really see that improved water quality for aquatic life may really lead to improved experience of water quality for the, the people that live along the river also. And then just finally, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to work with some economists on uh, the economic value of restoring dissolved oxygen. And it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, approaching a billion dollars of economic benefit um, to our communities, particularly the communities that live right along the river that have had to suffer through this poor water quality for literally 100 years now, right? Communities like, like Camden and, and, and parts of Philadelphia and Chester and, and Gloucester County. Um, so, so huge benefits, like literally hundreds of millions, perhaps even exceeding a billion dollars because our, our study was conservative and couldn't estimate and another study is coming out from the University of Delaware. So, so really big benefits um, to communities in addition to the benefits uh, to the aquatic life, to fish like sturgeon and striped bass and shad. We're, we're coming up um, toward the, the end of our presentation, but I'd like to try to fit in one last question. So recognizing that we've got some limited time left, but how could climate change and sea level rise affect the estuary and the restoration of oxygen? Uh, the, I'll, I'll start that and say really quickly, uh, uh, warmer water holds less oxygen. You, can, you can't dissolve oxygen as well in warmer water. So that's actually one of our, our big threats here. And saltier water is also um, uh, uh, less able to dissolve oxygen. So, so both of the kind of key threats that we have from sea level rise 
you know, from the salinity with all of our dredging, moving it back in. And then just the warmer temperatures might mean that it's even harder to maintain um, our existing dissolved oxygen conditions, much less the, the improved standards that sturgeon need, like 6.3 milligrams per liter. So, so there's some very real and immediate threats um, from climate change just on the dissolved oxygen front. Um, but then it also, of course, affects so many other parts, uh, the spawning grounds for Atlantic sturgeon with sea level rise, um, you know, the hyd hydrodynamics drought uh, floods, like the floods we've seen so far this year. I don't know if, if uh, Jessica or Doug want to speak to that also. But um, yeah, climate change um, can impact many aspects of this restoration, perhaps even indicating why we need to take action sooner, um, because we're going to be facing additional threats. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add there other than we will, we have 30 years of kind of increased temperature that's already baked in. So what we're seeing on DO standards and DO levels, that's only going to, you know, heat, increased heat is only going to exacerbate these, these problems going forward. And there will be obviously annual fluctuation, but the problem is, is only going to get worse um, if we don't improve uh, the DO standards. Yeah, and I, I just want to add on that I think that that's not to say that climate change means that action now is futile, right? It's And the Clean Water Act doesn't permit that. So we can't just say, well, the water is going to warm anyway. It won't be able to hold oxygen. What's the point of trying harder? The Clean Water Act doesn't allow that. And that's not the world we want to live in anyway, right? We want to be taking action now so that we can um, preserve the improvements that have occurred in the river and that we can continue to preserve them in the face of the increased challenges of climate change. So so just uh, um, on, on requests, um, just uh, want to, um, Doug, maybe you want to speak just a little bit to solutions, um, again, recognizing the limited time that we've got left, but uh, what can you, what can you get, tell us about the solutions here? Yeah, so I, I think this is, um, I, I wanted to address this incredibly quickly. You know, we talk about, but we talk about the problem. The solution is, you know, is is using existing technology to increase uh, what, I mean, it's not the only solution, but it's one of the best ones is in, use existing technology to increase, uh, to increase uh, water treatment technology, which has actually been used in other parts of the estuary. Um, and I, I wanted to just give a chance for other others to weigh in quickly on this. You know, what we're calling for is not impossible. It's essentially saying we should be using the same technology we've used in other parts of the watershed in the lower Delaware uh, for the treatment of, of wastewater. Yeah, the, the, the treatment, <clears throat> again, that we're asking for is just simple secondary treatment. Most folks probably live in areas, unless you're in Philadelphia or Camden County, um, that actually have the type of treatment that we're asking for. Um, uh, uh, secondary treatment, nitrification, uh, just not discharging ammonia and all of the BOD compounds into the estuary that chew it up. Um, so, so it's conventional technology um, and, and it can easily be done and probably should, been, should have been done decades ago. Okay. Um, well, uh, again, as we're wrapping up right here, make sure uh, if you're taking down those uh, links on the screen, um, this is an opportunity to grab those there or grab them from the chat. Um, but uh, um, I'm afraid it is, we're, we're right at one o'clock. I'm afraid it is time to wrap up our session. I wanna thank our speakers once again for taking their time, the time to share their knowledge and expertise. A lot of information shared here today. Thanks everyone for being here.